Yeah, and, and I'll just take 60 seconds just because I love context. So yeah. diet yeah. breaks is a segment of a broader category referred to as nonlinear dieting. So nonlinear dieting is exactly what it sounds like. It's dieting, but taking breaks from a diet. And that can be manifested as diet breaks, which is what we're going to focus on. And that's typically one week or more in the research literature, one, typically two weeks of a complete break from the diet where the client, or in my case, the subject goes back to maintenance calories or pre-diet calories. We also have diet refeeds where instead of taking a week or two weeks off the diet, it's usually like one or two days per week. So we would categorize that as a diet refeed. Mm -hmm. And then also under this umbrella of nonlinear dieting is things like alternate day fasting, where you eat nothing or a very small amount of food one day. Even time-restricted feeding could potentially fall into this as you look at what happens intraday with your feeding patterns. So all of this fits under nonlinear dieting. In terms of diet breaks, again, think of this in terms of taking a break for, from a week-long perspective, whether it's one or two weeks. And this process in my world, in the research world, really got popularized with a study that was published in 2016, 2017, maybe even 2018, called the Matador study. Mm. It was obese males. Uh, they took diet breaks every four weeks for two weeks straight. And they did like, I think it was four cycles of that. And they lost more body fat. They were able to maintain their resting metabolic rate. And the whole world went crazy. Diet breaks are, are just amazing. And since that time, there's been a few follow-up studies, mine being one of them. Mm -hmm. And the data um, has never replicated that. Now, and what I remember you saying about diet breaks, and I don't remember if it was one week, two weeks, whatever the time frame was, but you said it's not, it's not uncommon for your clients to actually lose body weight during this week or two. And now we fast forward, oh geez, seven years seven later, years. we will yeah. be publishing a diet break study here in the next two months in resistance trained females. And I, one of the things we did, and we can talk about this later, mm -hmm. we actually monitored the, the weights of every subject at home during the diet break. So it kind of, um, yeah. So yeah, to some, to, to some extent, if not to a large extent, just my conversation with you, you know, you plant the seed and then here we are seven years later trying to validate kind of what your philosophy was or your hypothesis. And then we did it in the lab. It's amazing to see it, honestly. And, and how I kind of stumbled upon it. Very, very simple. Honestly, I played sports my entire life. So I pretty much started playing football when I think I was 11, maybe 11 or 12 years old or something. And anybody who's ever watched the Tampa Bay Bucks game, you know, whatever, or watched a football game knows that there was always a halftime, right? And the halftime for a coach and, a, and, and an athlete was to reevaluate what happened in the first half. It's to take a break. It's to drink some water, maybe get a little snack. And then, you know, you get your directions from your coach. How are we going to change things to do a better job in the second half? And honestly, when I was going through these competition preps that I was doing all by myself at the time, um, I prepped myself for about seven or eight competitions uh, before I had hired Lane in 2012. And um, in that time, I noticed I was like, I am just extremely fatigued. Like nobody was talking about having any breaks. I was, I was just tired, right? And it actually happened because I was in my own diet phase and I decided, I'm like, hey, let's, let's, instead of doing one high carb day, what happens if I do two of them back to back, right? And then I started to feel better. And I said, well, what happens if I do three of them back to back? And I felt even better. And I'm like, well, what if I did four or five? Or what if I just took a whole week off? You know, like not off, but it, it was still intentional that I had high carb macros on those days. And I just remember how much better I felt. And in that moment, I said, this needs to be something like everybody's doing. And I think I made the first, like, the, well, the first that I had seen was a YouTube video on diet breaks in 2015. Um, even looking back at it now, like I just did it because I and my clients were tired. Like you're halfway through a prep, things are starting to slow down. You obviously know metabolic adaptation, T3 slowing down, stress is getting high and the results aren't coming as fast as they did early on. And we would implement this break. And then it was just like, 
But it was just like, you just floored the gas again and the progress kept coming again. And I said, wow, this should be something that everybody does, at least in some capacity. Now it's obviously evolved and there's a lot of different ways to implement the, these things. But I saw it so much of a psychological benefit, uh, also a physiological benefit and just understanding that you could give yourself almost like a halftime if you're an, if you're, if you're an athlete, which we are, we're trying to transform our bodies. We're trying to compete in bodybuilding shows. We're athletes. Why not give yourself a halftime so you can reevaluate and, you know, re re reassess things. Yeah. I, I, that has been the best theoretical rationale that you just said, I'm going to, I'm going to be using that one and I'll give you credit. The, whole, <laughs> the halftime you, analogy. <laughs> Thank the, you, sir. Yeah. Appreciate the that. sport <laughs> is football and you take a break exactly like you said, to reassess what's our strategy going in the second half. Dieting is the sport or it's the activity of a physique athlete. That's kind of, you know, that's where the action is. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That that's, yeah. that's, it's, it makes so much yeah. sense to hear so, it phrased like that. Yeah. I like to say that I, you know, I mean, you, you do though, if for anybody, nutrition coaches out there listening to this, you conduct the closest level of research that us as coaches have as a guideline on how to coach our clients. And I think that's extremely valuable as well. And the fact that that's really what we're doing in many cases, if you're an evidence-based practitioner or coach is we're taking what's available and we're using it as a guideline. We're trying not to go too far this way, go too far that way, but actually use it as a guideline to be the best evidence-based coaches that we can be in the space while also prioritizing health. And on the topic of health, something that I've been talking a lot about over the last few years is kind of doubling down on the female health side or the female health movement. And I know that a lot of the work that you've been doing at the University of South Florida does revolve around females and body recomposition, losing body fat, implementing diet breaks and things like this. Uh, would you mind speaking a little bit about the uh, diet breaks and resistance trained females? Uh, I believe the research has not been published yet. Correct. Yeah. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah. Our study has been accepted for publication in the Journal awesome. of Human Kinetics. Um, it will probably be another two months before it actually gets published. Um, and real quick, just before I, I jump into that, you said something that triggered a thought for me. So I've asked you on, I think the last two or three times we happened to run, in, run into each other about female health, particularly in pre- um, peri or postmenopausal women. Um, so that I think in my own life, that's going to be the next frontier, not this year, mm -hmm. not next year, but going forward. And I've always appreciated you and you actually have like a team of or at least one expert on your team that kind of, I forget his name, but yeah, just, really, yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's I knew, I knew it if I heard it. So thank you for having an, an interest and, and kind of pioneering that because from what I've seen, there's plenty of research, mm -hmm. but the fitness industry ignores that segment. I don't know yeah. why. I mean, you're not. Yeah. But in general. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, props I to you. personally, I noticed that as well. I was like, there, there's a research here that's available. I mean, it, it, it was done in the first research I actually stumbled upon. It was done in like female athletes. So they, you know, what they called hypothalamic amenorrhea was the female athlete triad, right? And essentially in 2015 or so, I started to notice that, hey, us as physique coaches, like, why are all of our female clients, they're all losing their cycles and, you know, they're not recovering or reverse dieting the way that we thought they should be. There's like some of these rogue people that are gaining back weight very rapidly. We don't know what's, what's going on, or they wouldn't get their cycles back for extended periods of time. And when I stumbled upon that research, I was like, something has to change here. And in all fairness, about 2018, 2019 was really where I decided to kind of take a turn away from the competition prep world and just sending as many women across stage as I could, or men, uh, to actually focusing more on recovering the ones that had gone over stage far too many times in too short of a time period, and then ultimately trying to get their health back.